Thank you, thank you. You can all take your seats, take your seats. Well, it's an absolute honour to bring the Word this morning. I just want to take a moment just to thank Pastor Shannon and Pastor Georgie for this opportunity. Let's give it up for our senior pastors, our amazing leaders. And why don't you thank the Enjoy Creative team. I said Empire First Service because I'm so used to doing Friday nights. But thank the Enjoy Creative team, did so well. But I'm really excited to bring the Word this morning and as Pastor George has already said, if you don't know me, my name is Aaron. Myself and my wife, Em, we lead the youth and young adults here at the West location. Me and my wife, we've been married for five, almost five years in January. It's gone like that. We uh, did the internship, like uh, Josh said, in 2017, and I absolutely loved it. I interned under Pastor Mick. So anyone here thinking about, should I put my application in today? Put your application in today. It's awesome. But I just wanted to say to you all, that it is an absolute honor to invest into the next and the now generation through the youth and young adults. And this year, God is doing something crazy. Week in, week out on Friday nights, we're seeing teenagers be saved and make decisions for Jesus. Two weeks ago, it's amazing. Two weeks ago, we saw nine teenagers in one night raise their hands and get saved by Jesus, which was amazing. And week in, week out, we're just seeing God move in our young adults as well, in our friendship groups and our real talks. It is amazing. So thank you for the honor of being able to invest into this generation. But who's ready for the word this morning? Yeah. So today's word is all about miracles and transformation. Come on, I said miracles and transformation. Are you excited about that? But in the form of obedience. Oh, I got you all there, didn't I? Everyone's taking back their, their, their claps all of a sudden. <laughs> We're going to be talking about a story in the Bible in John of Jesus healing a blind man, but being healed in a very unusual way. And I just want to break down a few ways that in our life that there is power in hearing the Word of God, but also literally walking out step by step the instructions that Jesus gives us on the way to our miracle. Because we can be believing for things. And sometimes Jesus' instructions He gives us seem so the opposite way to what we think we should be doing. Because who here has something they're believing for in their life? Whether it be a miracle, whether it be healing, whether it be breakthrough, you might be praying for years or just recently, whatever it is, it doesn't matter that we're all believing for something. And this can be a sermon, this can be a message which lands in a faith-filled place, an encouraging place for us to believe for miracles and get our miracles, which is amazing and it will happen. We've been singing all morning about God giving us the breakthrough. But what if towards the miracle, on our way towards the breakthrough, whatever it is in your life, that God wants to do so much more than just give you that? He will give you that, but maybe He wants to reveal to you along the way something in your life which has kingdom reverberations for our time here on earth. A legacy which is going to affect generations and generations and generations. What if God wants to reveal something to you today? And that's what I want to talk about today. So if you've got your Bibles, turn to John 9. And we're going to be starting in verse 1 all the way through to verse 11, I think. John 9, verse 1, it says, As he went along, he saw a blind man from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Continues in verse 6. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. Verse 8 then says, His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. Everyone say, I am the man. I am the man. How then were your eyes opened, they asked. He replied, The man they called Jesus made some mud, put it on my eyes. He told me to go wash in the pool. So I went and washed and then I could see. Dear God, we just pray today, Lord, that right now, Lord, as we're in your house, you just reveal more of yourself to us, more of your purpose, your plan. We thank you for miracles that are happening, but right now, Lord, reveal who you are to us. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. amen. Well, me and my wife, like I said, almost been married five years. Recently, we have 
moved into a new season of our life. You're probably thinking, oh, so maybe some news coming up. Well, we got a puppy. We got a dog. We got a dog. And as you might be thinking, that's the next step on the way to whatever comes next. We're not going to talk about that right now. But we got a puppy. I absolutely love my little puppy. It's my first animal that I ever got in my life. First, I never had dogs growing up. I love dogs. Do you know what I did have growing up? I had fish and hermit crabs. Used to look after the hermit crabs. My mom worked as a science lab oversight in a school. So on the holidays, we used to look after the hermit crabs. That was the pets that we had. But we adopted this dog. And the story behind this dog is that I was setting up on a Friday for Empire a couple of months ago. And these two staffy puppies, little staffy puppies, just walked into church. Not even joking. They just walked into church. And some of the, uh, Emily and another girl here in the office took them to the vet because they weren't microchipped. No one was claiming them. And the vet says, oh, hey, we're just going to have to take them to the lost dog's home and someone can come and claim them if they want. The lost dog, we put our names down for adoption. The lost dog home said, look, these dogs are probably dumped. We've done all the health checks and we adopted that puppy. So me and Em say, our dog found Jesus. Our dog found the church, saw the big welcome home sign out the front and said, that's a place I want to go. That's a praise report right there. Yeah, excited about that. But what I'm learning about my dog, this being a first-time dog owner for me, Em's owned a few dogs throughout her life, grew up with them. I'm learning a lot about obedience. And for me, we've just moved into our new house. We've been there for a year. I've just finished all of the landscaping. And I say that with relief. I've just finished all of the landscaping. But now we decide to get this puppy, right? And this puppy loves eating plants. All of my plants. I'm telling you, I've replanted and planted 12 magnolias, and she's ate them all. I'm sick of it. I'm actually sick of it. I came home during the week, and I saw she's eaten all 12 of my magnolias. And I said to Emma, I texted her and said, I'm done. I'm not replanting these plants till she gets older. And Em, thank you. She brings all the patience and self-control in the relationship. She said, no, we can teach this puppy how to act. And I know it's a, it's a funny connection, but I'm learning that obedience with this dog actually brings her more freedom. When she listens to instruction, it's not for her demise. We don't lock her up. It actually brings her more freedom when she is obedient. And I know the connection here is funny, but it's sometimes the same with us, that we can focus on something that we want. We can focus so much on one thing that we want that maybe Jesus is, you know, wanting to reveal something else to us along the way. Maybe he's wanting to reveal something else to us. Because when we read that passage in John 9, there's so many things that I, you know, I read into when I'm reading this passage of what Jesus was going through at that time. You see, why didn't Jesus just heal that man instantly? Because we know he can. Five chapters before that, he says to the man, pick up your mat and walk, healed like that. So disciples know what he can do. We know what he can do. So why didn't he just heal the man straight away? And at this point in the Gospels, Jesus has a lot of enemies right now. He's got political enemies. He's got the Pharisees spreading rumors and lies and already plotting to kill him. So from a PR perspective, if Jesus is going to like make his image look good here, he should just heal this man straight away like he did before. Why didn't he heal this man? And we can read into this, this story and think of all these questions that come up and we apply to our own life. Why was there no clear path or clear explanation of to why Jesus did what he did? Doesn't this bring more confusion into maybe your situation today? Maybe you've been believing for a breakthrough or a miracle. You've been praying the same prayer for years and years and years and haven't seen it come to pass yet. And you're thinking, what is going on here? Why can't Jesus heal me like he did the man who picked up the mat? Why am I going through all this other stuff as well? Because I'm going to have some license here, but I want to read the Bible like this. I want to read this verse and it says, Jesus meets blind man. Next sentence, Jesus heals blind man. Come on, isn't that, that's something I can get behind. Get behind a healing, get behind a miracle, amazing. And sometimes that's what we want for our life as well, in our relationship with God. We want to bring something to God, bring something to Jesus, and Him for, come through straight away. But maybe along the way, God is wanting to do something so much more than just a miracle. These miracles are amazing. We're going to receive them. He promises that. But maybe He wants us to receive transformation along the way as well. He wants us to receive transformation. And there's a process to it. And I'm a process guy. I love, you know, putting things in order and things like that. And I also love researching the, the history behind things. I like knowing where things were geographically. I studied maps in uni, so I love knowing where things are. So I searched up the Pool of Siloam. I searched it up and they found it. 
Incredible. It's in Jerusalem. It's still there today on the East Bank, and it was a ceremonial washing pool. And I think we have some photos of it up here. We've got two different photos, and I love what it looks like because it, look, it reminds me of the Peninsula Hot Springs, and I love the Peninsula Hot Springs. Tell me, I'm there most winters, man. I love it. There's like a Roman Greco-style sauna down there. Oh, it's my favorite. I was sitting there for hours just pouring water over my head. You know, it's like just cleanse you out. It feels amazing. But this was the Pool of Siloam. So it's incredible. Look, it looks so peaceful down there. You know, some running water through there. It's pure. It's nice. But what I noticed about the Pool of Siloam, where this man was healed, is look at all of those stairs. Look at the staircase. That's a steep staircase for Jesus to send a blind man down. I don't think they had guardrails 2,000 years ago. There's no guardrails back then. There's no AHS procedures 2,000 years ago. There wasn't a man with a clipboard and a hard hat there ticking off things and saying, no, nah, you guys are going to move this balustrade here, here, here. No, Jesus sent a blind man down a set of stairs, but also a wet set of stairs because it's near a pool. So why would Jesus do this? So let's summarize here where this guy is at. Jesus meets a blind man, spits in the ground, puts mud on his eyes, then sends him down a staircase alone. The stairs are wet. Why would Jesus do all of this when the disciples knew and we know that Jesus can heal a man just like that? Why would Jesus do this? God's ultimate goal of Scripture, His Word, is to reveal more of Himself to us. Reveal his character, his purpose, and his plan for us in every area of our life, even in unusual methods, even through things that we don't know what is going on. So today, I want to break, through, break down these steps of obedience, this staircase of obedience this man took towards his miracle. He literally walked out obedience with Jesus. And when he took those steps, not only physically was he healed, but spiritually what was changed in him, what was molded in him, and how not only was he healed at the end, but transformed from the inside out. Because I know, like I've said, we've all got things in this room we're believing for. No matter how you come into that, the miracle you're believing for, the healing, the breakthrough, and amen to all of that, you will receive that. But along the way, what is God wanting to transform in you today before you get your miracle? Romans 12, 1 to 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. So our transformation, the transformation in your life, is directly connected to being able to live in the will of God. You want to know what the will of God is in your life? You want to live in the will of God in your life? Well, be transformed by Jesus, and you will be able to live in that will in your life. And further in our lives is that miracles... Miracles are something we should pray for. Miracles are something that we should believe for and God wants us to do. But miracles change a moment, right? Transformation changes our life. But miracles and transformation create a legacy that can be passed for generations and generations and generations. And that's what He wants to give us. Just like this blind man today walking towards his miracle, God revealed to him so much more than just a physical miracle. Before he even got to the bottom of the staircase, he was transformed spiritually on the inside. That when he got his miracle, he knew it wasn't anything of his doing. He knew and he pointed only to Jesus. So on the way to your miracle today, church, on the way to whatever you are believing for, what is God wanting to reveal to you today? And what are the steps that he is wanting you today, speaking to you about today? The steps in your life that you need to take today that you need to take this week, that you need to take in this next season, that you need to take in this next year of legacy to be transformed by God. And he's broken down in this story, and I love this story. And we start all the way back in verse 3 where it says, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so the works of God might be displayed in him. Now, that's the point of our life, right? To glorify God. Our lives are here to glorify God. And it's so easy to glorify God in strength and fruit, right? We feel pumped up, all praise to God. But how can we glorify God through our weakness? How can we glorify God through what we are struggling with? How can we glorify God through what we're addicted to? You see, Jesus showed us exactly how to do this. He died on the cross and he rose again. Amazing. I can get behind that. <laughs> but see, Jesus did so much more than that as well. 
what he did with the cross, the cross was a Roman torture machine. The cross was used to bring not only for death, but to bring shame on that person. It was the most shameful way you could be executed in that time. It not only brought shame on the person being executed, it brought shame on their family and anyone who was connected to them. Just shame. But what Jesus did, just like our lives, he changed something that was a symbol of shame, a symbol of destruction, and he changed it into victory, into hope, and to peace, that when now people see the cross, they see victory in Jesus' name. And Jesus did the exact same thing in our life. Our weakness is a weapon for God's glory. That's what he wants to do in every part of your life, even more so right now in the areas that you are struggling with, that you're laboring in, that you're addicted in, where there is pain. That's where Jesus wants to work the most. That's where he wants to turn your life around the most so his glory will be shown through your weakness. So how can we today turn our challenges and our pain into glorifying God? What is that air in your life right now that's a hindrance that you should be using as an opportunity to glorify God in your life? Are you looking at your weakness through the lens of something else this morning? Well, Jesus is saying today, he wants to see his glory come through in your situation. And it all starts through transformation. Because then we move from that, Jesus outlines that, then he moves to verse 6 where he goes, after saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. This is unusual. I asked Pastor Christian if we could get a bucket of mud up here and I'll spit in it and I'll put it on Ryan's face. But he said, I got banned for doing that. No, I didn't even, didn't even go there. Didn't even go there. But like I said, a few chapters before that, the same disciples that were with him saw Jesus tell the man to pick up the mat and walk. And like that, he was healed. So now I'm sure they're getting ready. For, they're probably sitting back thinking, you guys got to watch this. This guy's going to get healed straight away. And all they hear is Jesus starts spitting in the mud and put it on the man's eyes. Praise God, they're behind Jesus still. They're like, yeah, it's going to happen. They're not sure. Maybe, maybe, maybe the enthusiasm's gone down a bit. They're wondering what has happened here. So why is Jesus using mud? Why is he using mud? Jesus found it important to change the methods of healing so no one could ever make a formula of how to get healed. Jesus did that on purpose. He's teaching us there that the power is in God, not doing things routinely, not doing things religiously without a focus on where our actual power comes from, and that's through God. Mud on the man's eyes is purposefully wacky and unusual. Why is that? It's because faith in God, viewed by the world, is wacky and unusual. The way that, the way that w- what we want to do in worship is wacky and unusual. Raising our hands in worship can look like wacky and unusual. But you got to let yourself to get uncomfortable with God in this next season. Whatever that, whatever that looks like for you, it might be raising your hands during worship. It might be getting baptized in the Holy Spirit. It might be getting baptized in water next week. If you're interested in getting baptized, go and sign up for that. It's an incredible decision. It might be desiring to speak in tongues. All these things God wants us to do and step out into the uncomfortable with Him because He wants us to rely on the power, not the method. He wants us to rely on the power. Looking foolish for the gospel. Looking wacky and unusual for the gospel is when the world sees we are struggling with this, but we know and we proclaim that we have a peace that surpasses all else. It's looking like your finances are like this and everyone can see it, but knowing that God is a provider. It's looking unusual as believing for something when your situation is going completely against you, but we're standing on faith and we're standing on the promises of God. But everyone at the same time is still staring at you because you've got mud on your eyes. So what does mud on your eyes look like today? In Jesus' ministry to us, he adopts no stereotyped approach. He deals with each of us uniquely and purposely. The end goal, yes, it's miracles, but the transformation along the way, it's so tailored to our needs so God can deal uniquely and personally what is in our hearts. God knows you personally. And I love that revelation that that we have a God who knows us personally. He knows your struggles, he knows your pain, your story, your journey, whatever that looks like, but the path to your miracle will be different to the person next to you. So do you have mud on your eyes today, church? What does that look like in your life to put mud on your eyes? Like I said, is it raising your hands during worship? Is it stepping out and talking to a pastor about something that you're struggling with? Is it coming to the worship night tonight and desiring more of the Holy Spirit? 
My story, when I walked into Enjoy Church seven years ago with M, I was a very, very reserved guy. The greeting team on the front door, that was my worst nightmare. And they're cheering, they're high-fiving. I'm like, oh, my goodness. Like, all my introvert stuff was like, this is not happening right now. I got way too much attention. And that's how I felt coming. I was like raising hands during worship. I'm like, that's not happening. That's definitely not happening. Who wants to get baptized in the Holy Spirit and start speaking in tongues? I'm like, nope. That's not happening either. I'm not taking a step out of my seat. Then we start talking about a vision offering. I'm like, it's my money. Don't touch my money. But every step that I took, every step that I took into the uncomfortable with God, into trusting Him more, every bit of more mud that I put on my eyes, it didn't make me see less, but actually brought me more freedom in God. Actually brought me more freedom in my relationships, in my faith in God and my walk with Him. Every time I put more mud on my eyes, gave me more freedom. We see in verse 7, he says, go wash in the pool. Verse 7 says, go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. I love this part. With the staircase, Jesus sends this blind man down the pool, down the stairs, the slippery staircase. And the thing about this staircase, like I said, it's a ceremony washing pool. You went down there to cleanse yourself of your sins. And now during this time, if you weren't washed already, you weren't going to touch anyone on the way down. So this blind man had to make this journey alone. No one helping him. A journey that Jesus sent him on. Why would Jesus send him on a journey all by himself with mud on his eyes already, making him even more confused and a staircase in front of him? Now, who knows that this journey might not have, it wouldn't have looked very graceful. It wasn't like those videos of like, you know, someone going to prom and walking down the staircase, you know what I mean? And everyone's like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. It doesn't look like that. This guy's walking down this staircase blind with no one to help him. But how incredible is his response that as soon as Jesus gave him the instruction, he said, yep, yeah, I'm in. I'm following you and whatever you say, Jesus. He wanted his breakthrough that whatever Jesus asked him to do, he said, Jesus, I will follow you. What changed in him during this moment of obedience? In our life, we want the miracle. We want the breakthrough. But do we take the steps of obedience that Jesus is asking us to take? We want healing. We want God to move in our life. But do we want to take the steps that sometimes take a bit of work? We want to see all these incredible things happen in our life and we're praying to God. But do we want to have that uncomfortable conversation with where our heart maybe really is at with someone? Do you want to really let God into all the parts of our life? Jesus says you'll be healed, then sends him down the staircase. Imagine what was happening in during that time as the keys come up. He didn't have a keyboard. I was just asking the guys to bring a keyboard. <laughs> but imagine what was happening to him as he took that journey down the stairs. Imagine what he was thinking about. Imagine what was being revealed to him. Imagine what he was thinking about, what his new life is going to look like, because he knows he's going to get healed. He's been hearing about this Jesus that is a healer, and he's just trusting what Jesus is asking him to do. Imagine he's thinking about how this will change his life, this moment that is coming up, and also all those who come after him in this moment. You see, walking down those stairs, being obedient and following Jesus' instructions to walk down those stairs, not only meant he got his physical vision, but it meant that he got spiritual vision as well. He was transformed. By the time he got to the end of that staircase, by the time he got to the pool and washed, and all of a sudden he could see, he was already transformed from the inside out. He got a vision for his life because of his obedience to the instructions of Jesus. So church, what is Jesus saying to you today? What is Jesus asking you to do today? Jesus, I'm believing for this, but maybe Jesus is saying back, I want you to plant yourself in community. That doesn't make sense. I want to get healed. Maybe you're asking God for provision, but He wants you to serve in this area. Maybe you're asking God, I'm, I'm too stressed, but He's saying, commit more time and resource to this place that I want you in. Maybe He's asking you to get more uncomfortable with God, to step out in faith with Him, to address that addiction in your life that you've had for years. What is the step that He wants you to take today? These are all steps we might need to take, steps on the way to our miracle. But I'm telling you, if you are obedient to the Word of God, obedient to what He asks you to do, obedient to His instruction, you'll get your miracle. We can get behind that, but you will be transformed from the inside out. 
you'll get a vision for your life that you've never had before. And like I said, when we receive that miracle, but we are also transformed, we build a legacy that can be told for generations and generations of the faithfulness of God. And finally, in verse 8, the people did not recognize this man. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. Everyone say, I am the man. Because of this man's obedience to Jesus, his willingness to look uncomfortable and a bit unusual, his obedience to take the steps that Jesus was asking him to take, he got his miracle. But he also got transformed so much to the point where they didn't even recognize him. A changed man in every area of his life. So much more than just what he was believing for. And what he was believing for was incredible. But Jesus did so much more for him than he even had faith for. He didn't just get a miracle. He got a renewed legacy he could pass down. But it's no surprise that no one recognized him. Because Jesus already spoke about that in verse 3. Jesus said that the works of God will be seen through this man's weakness. Other translations say the glory of God will be seen through this man. And what do we know about it through reading Scripture is that every time the glory of God is poured out, every time the glory of God is shown through someone, their literal physical appearance looks different. Think of Moses up on the mountain. The glory comes down different. Saul and to Paul, the glory, the light, different. Even Jesus himself on the mountain, the transfiguration, the glory brings difference. So the glory was shown through this man's life, through his weakness, and his literal physical appearance was changed. He was different forever. He was transformed forever. And it's the same in our life. God's glory will be shown through your weakness. God's glory will be shown through even the hardest, the most painful part of your life, and you will be changed forever. So what is the step of obedience that God wants you to take today? What is just that next step on the staircase that God is saying, do this? I'm hearing that you're believing for this. I'm hearing your prayers. I'm hearing you cry out. You've been faithful for years and years and years, but right now I want you to do this today. What is Jesus asking you to do today? The man with mud on his eyes, he looked unusual, but he received boldness and faith to proclaim the gospel. And we see that at the very end. I think it's in verse 25. The guys don't have it. A bit further on the story. Where the Pharisees are asking him, who did this? Who did this? Did this actually happen? Are you the same guy? And he goes, I don't know what the heck you guys are talking about. I don't have all the answers. I'm not a theological whiz or whatever it is. And it rhymes. There you go. But he says three words. He says, Lord, I believe. And that's all his testimony needs to be. And he got that, that boldness to proclaim the gospel from his obedience to God. Through the staircase, he received a faith and renewed trust in God and a vision from his life that he never had before. And his transformation was complete through God's glory being shown through his weakness. He got his miracle. He got his miracle, which is amazing, but he got so much more than that. He got transformation as well. So what does the mud look like in your life today? What does the staircase look like in your life today? What is stepping out and looking uncomfortable with God look like in your life today? So with every head bowed and eye closed, in just a moment between you and God, ask Him right now. God, you know all the areas I'm praying for, I'm believing for, I've got faith for. That I want to see happen in my life. But Jesus, right now, what do you want to reveal to me in my heart? What are the areas in my heart, in my life, the way I'm living, that you just want me to realign with you today? That you want me to come to you and repent and say, God, forgive me, and He will. And what does He want you to do next? What is the step that He wants you to take next? So with every eye closed and just having this time with God. If that's you, why don't you just put your hands out in front of you and just receive from Him this morning. Just receive His goodness this morning. Receive His faithfulness this morning. And just ask Him right now, what is the next step? Dear God, we thank You, Lord, that You are sovereign, Lord, that You are all-powerful. We thank You for the miracles. 
and the promises and the purpose that you have for our life, Lord. But right now, God, just like this man in our story, Jesus, speak to us about what our next step needs to be right now, God. Show us, the, search our hearts and show us the areas that we just need to give to you right now, Lord, that we've been hiding, that we've been holding back from you, Lord. And right now, Lord, just help your glory to come through our weakness, Lord. Let you be glorified through our weakness, Jesus, and show us what that next step looks like in our life on the way to our miracle. And before I close today, with every eye still closed, I just want to give an opportunity for anyone who hasn't given their life to Jesus and wants to enter into a relationship with God, an opportunity right now. We've been worshiping all service. We've been hearing from so many people about the faithfulness of God, about the purpose and the plan and the call that is on their life through a relationship with Jesus. You might be sitting there and wondering, I want that. I haven't been living for Him, but I want that. You can feel Him tugging on your heart this morning. Well, all you need to do is make a decision for Him today. It says in the Bible that we have all fallen short of the glory of God, every single one of us. We all haven't met the standard of how God wants us to live, but it goes on to say in Romans that we have all been redeemed through the blood of Christ, through Jesus dying on the cross and rising again. We have been redeemed through His blood. You have been covered. And all you need to do to accept that grace, to accept that forgiveness, is make a decision for Him today. This might be your first time making this decision, the first time you've heard about this Jesus. Well, today and this moment is right for you right now. Or maybe you've been living for God in the past, but you know if you're honest with yourself right now, that you know that you aren't living a life for Jesus. Well, this moment is for you as well. All you need to do is return to Him, to make a decision for Him, and He will accept you with open arms. So on the count of three in a second, if that's you, I just want you to be really bold and raise your hands. And when that outward expression of what's happening inwardly, when you do that, the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you and your life will never be the same again. So one, Jesus loves you. Two, you'll never be the same again. And three, if that's you, why don't you just raise your hand? See those two hands down there? It's amazing. Third hand there, incredible. Thank you, Jesus. Anyone else in this place today? I want to rush this moment. God is speaking to you today to return to Him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. What I'm going to give it up for those people who gave their life to Jesus this morning. Incredible, incredible decision. And right now together, church, we're just going to pray a prayer together as a church family just to solidify that decision in our hearts today. So repeat after me. Dear Jesus, I thank you today for dying on the cross, for rising again. I thank you that my sins are covered and that I can now live a life for you and have purpose for you in this life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, let's give some God some praise this morning. Amazing. Well, if you raise your hand today, our new Christians team up the back, they saw your hand. They want to give you a Bible. They want to ask you how we can help you in your next step in this season, answer any questions that you have about the decision that you just made. It's incredible. It's incredible. Let's get off for those people again. Incredible. Well, church, I hope that encouraged you this morning. Let's go into this week and take some next steps in God.